All right, so this is 2.2, the limit of a function and limit laws. And I know I've already scared you guys because I've told, well, some of you have already been scared that had this in calculus in high school. Um, I've already told you this is the hardest part for most students, not this section. When it gets hard is the next section. This is still, this is kind of what a limit is, okay? We're not being real formal yet. All right, so let's say, for example, how does, bless you, does the function f of x equals x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 behave near, and that is the keyword, x equals 1. I'm not asking you what the value of the function is at x equals 1. That is very, very important. Otherwise, you'll never understand limits. I don't care what the value of the function is, because most of you are already looking at that and saying, well, you can't plug in a 1 because you're going to divide by 0. I want to know what's happening near 1. That's what a limit is. What? Hello? Yes? What's the line, like tangent line near 1? Well, let's, so if you graph this, it's kind of weird. So if I actually graph, and let's put some, sorry, I'm getting in kind of my writing right there. 1 and 2. Believe it or not, when you graph this, it, it looks like that, just a line. Why? Look at that top. You remember something about algebra days? Difference of square? Yeah. So what if I actually factor that into x minus 1, x plus 1 over x minus 1? That cancels. Well, that's just simply the graph of a line of x plus 1, except I cannot plug in 1. Why can I not plug in 1? Because if I plug in 1, I'm dividing by 0. Meaning, if you remember this in um, kind of how I teach uh, students in algebra or pre-cal, when you do domains, you want to so bad say, well, I could plug in 1 here, but you have to go back every single step. And can you plug 1 in here? Well, no. Okay, and that, that's the problem, and that's why you see the hole right there. So this graph, graph is a line y equals x plus 1 with the point 1, 2 removed. And hopefully you can see, well, where'd you get the 2 from? Well, if I did plug in a 1 on that very last step, then the value of this function of 1 plus 1, which would be 2. So that's how I got the 2. If we wanted to do this kind of, sort of, without calculus, and this is what we talked about last class and the class before, what if I got really, 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 really close to 1? I mean really close to 1. Meaning, like, what if I pick some values like 0 0.9? That's pretty close to 1. And I plug it in just right here. I don't have to go through all the steps because I have so nicely factored this out. So I get a value of 1.9. Well, what if I pick something on the other side? In other words, what you, you're going to see me do is I'm picking values close to 1. And so if I pick something, say, on the other side, then I get 2.1. If I pick 0 0.99, I want to get a little closer, I get 1.99. If I pick something on the other side, I mean, we can do this all stinking day. But my point is what's happening here is the function values all get close to a limiting value. I feel sorry for y'all having to read my handwriting of 2. Well, and this is why this is, this is the most important concept. If you can get this wrapped in your head, and it's, it's pretty hard because you've been beat to death with algebra, where they say, you know, what's the value of, of the function at um, x equals 1? Well, most of you would say it doesn't exist because there's a hole right there. Some of you might say, well, it's 2. Well, the value of the function at x equals 1 is not 2, but it's getting really, really, really close to 2, and that's what a limit is. 
as we approach some x value, what is happening to the value of our function? So let's kind of write it all mathy and nerdy because, again, this is the way you see it written in your textbook, and you need to be able to be able to read these definitions. So if we have some function is close to L, which L is what we're going to call our limit. This is, again, a lazy way to write for all. You'll see that written a lot that way, so like a V with a line through it. For all x sufficiently, I think I'm missing a T, sufficiently close to some point, our point of interest, and that's what we'll call x naught. That's our point of interest then we say that our function approaches the limit L as X approaches X naught. I know it's, there's a lot of writing, but this is a very, very important definition. Okay, so if some function is close to some limiting value for all x values, okay, and then we say, well, we're interested in a particular x value that gets really, really close to our interest, okay, you might even put that in your notes. This is our, our value of interest. Then we say that this function approaches some limiting value as x approaches x naught. This whole definition you will see written, and you'll write it over and over this way, as the limit of some function as x approaches some value equals L. So that's what we're going to work on. A lot of problems, and you're going to see everything written this way, meaning you're going to be given some function here. And I'm going to say, well, as the function gets close and close and close to some value, Okay, some x value, and you might think of it this way, some x value, what's the y value? Okay, does it mean it has to equal that? Because in other words, our previous example, so previous example, you would see that written as the limit of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 as x up, bless you, approaches 1. <coughs> equals 2. So that's how you would see it written without that. There's a question on a test. I should get that question. And you're going to see as we do a bunch of examples, the very first thing you always try to do is plug that, you just plug it in. If that doesn't work, then you got to do something else. The something else in this section is factoring things. Okay, and so if you're, again, as I keep saying in calculus, if your algebra is good, you're not, you're not too bad with factoring things out. But the big thing, and this is the huge, um, the big kahuna, is we're not saying the value of this function at x equals 1 is 2, because at x equals 1, the value doesn't exist. It's very important you're understanding that, that we're saying when we get close to that value, and sometimes the value <laughs> of the function and the limits are the same. Okay, and we'll see that. And again, this is, you know, very, very informal way of telling you what a limit is. So let's look at the identity, identity function. Who knows what the identity function is? Y equals what? Remember that identity? Y equals X. Every X value, same Y value. Okay, well, we're writing these as functions, so let's write it as f of x equals x for all, whatever x value I'm interested in. I want to find the limit of this function as x approaches x naught. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug, I have a function, I'm going to plug it in. So the limit... Now, this is just teachers, you will learn, teachers teach the way they learned it. I always learn to put the function in parentheses, so don't let 
this throw you like, hey, she forgot to put an F there. No, that is my function. That is that function. I just plugged it in for F of X. I want to know what the limit as X approaches some value. I want to know what this equals. Anybody know? X naught. Very good. Now, for those of you that are going, how did it, how did they know that? They, they'd be smart, right? What I would do is I'd graph it, okay? And this is, this is typically, I, again, I don't know why, you know, a big no-no with other teachers that I don't want you to graph, you know, I want you to do it on pen and paper. I want you to graph first because then you go, oh, by looking at the graph, and then you can finally see it. Well, if I graph the function y, uh-oh, <laughs> y equals x, doesn't it look just like that? I mean, any value that I pick, see if it lets me get rid of that one, any value that I pick for x, if I pick this value, guess what, technically we could say that's x. If that's x naught, that's x naught. That's what the identity function is. If you, if you like it better, write it, y equals x, that's all it is, okay? So no matter, and this is what we're saying, this is our limit. No matter, no matter what value you pick here, pick one there, guess what? It's going to be the same value. And that's what the identity function says. All right, so if I have a constant function, what's a constant function look like? Straight line. Straight line. All right, so f of x equals k, some constant. So our limit as x approaches x naught of our function, I'm going to do it in two steps again, our limit of k, because that's our function, as x approaches x naught. So again, all I did these steps is where I saw f of x, I plugged in my actual function. I mean, so the, the first step is the format. And then a lot of times, this will be an actual number, okay? But I'm just saying for all, and that's what I set up here, for all x naught. Doesn't matter which x naught you pick, these answers are going to be the same. All right, so if this is kind of sort of making sense to you, what's the answer? Okay, because if I graph something here, let's say here's x naught, let's say here's y equals k, if you don't like the letters, okay, let's say y equals 5. That's my constant function. Well, no matter what value I pick, you want x naught here, I want it over here, it doesn't matter. My function is approaching the same value. Notice I said approaching, I did not say my function is equaling. And that's important. It just so happens these two, they are the same. Equal and approaching are the same. But a limit is not an equal. It's approaching. It's getting close to a value. So if I said, for example, what's the limit of 3 as x approaches that value? What's the answer? Very good. So in other words, that didn't make a difference because as if you were looking at the graph, you were saying, well, okay, you're way out here, but guess what? I'm still here at y equals 3. All right, we also have limits that fail to exist. And this is kind of, well, in some ways it's unfortunate for those that have had calculus because you already know this first one, the reason why. And I'm going to go ahead and mention it, but it'll come later. All right, so we have a jump meaning something like, I don't know, we might have something that's open here, and then it jumps up, and it goes that way. Okay, you got some machine that's sitting here running, and they shut it off. The next morning, they turn it on, and this is where it starts out, and then away it goes. Well, for those of you that have had calculus before, and those of you in here will get this later, the real reason this is happening is we actually have what's called left-hand and right-handed limits, if I'm approaching, let's say x equals zero, if I'm approaching from the left, I'm actually approaching this value. Remember what I said, it does not have to equal the function and you might say, uh-uh, there's a hole right there. 
but I'm getting really, really, really close to that hole, really close. If I'm up here coming from the right, then notice this is the value that it's approaching. Okay, and that's again important, but in this section, and some of you that have had calculus in high school, you can already, your mind may, can't let go of the left hand and the right hand, that's fine. But for those of you that this is new to, it's a, it's a jump. There's a jump in the function. All right, another one is it grows large without bound, without bound. <laughs> meaning you might have something that looks like this. And I say, well, what's happening as you approach x equals zero? Well, it depends on what side you're coming from. You know, if you're walking from this house over here, then it looks like it's heading up to infinity. If you're walking from over here, it looks like it's heading down to negative infinity. Again, something you're gonna learn later. Well, what do you do with that? Okay, we definitely have infinite limits. And then the last one, probably the best example is a trig function. It just oscillates too much. In other words, the function really never hones in on any value. You know, it may start out like this, and then all of a sudden it just starts going crazy. And you can never pinpoint an actual value. You guys sure sneeze a lot. Are you spreading germs? <laughs> Hearing all the sneezing going on. All right, and so in other words, it's just going crazy right here, and I can't tell you what the function's going to, what it's getting close to. It's just good. The function's going crazy. All right. I mentioned at the beginning that you will have a quiz on Friday. You have a quiz every Friday. And it will be over this section. Okay. So probably you want to do your homework maybe Wednesday. Come in and ask her questions. This will be, and you have a homework problem that looks like this. This will be one of the problems on the quiz. So how, not this exact problem, but like it. How to find limits from graphs. And again, why, why I believe you should know how to find a limit from the graph first. So if I have, let's say this is at one, and I have some line doing this, and that's at one, and then I have some line doing this, that's solid, and that's two, and then at three, it's open. And then there's a point right there. Okay, so give you a minute to get your graph copied down. So all I've done is say, well, this is some function that something's happening here. Then we start back up here, goes up solid, then it jumps, and then it goes off again. All right, so find, and we'll just call this entire function g of x. Okay, it's just, just some function. It is one function, piecewise function. So find the limit of this function, g of x, as x approaches 1. What's the answer? Zero. I heard 0, but be careful, it does not exist. Okay, so does not exist. The reason why, if I'm heading to 1, and well, you may have said 0 thinking of that point, the value of the function is zero, but notice, as I said, for those of you that have never had calculus, there's a jump there. For those of you that have had calculus, you're thinking, oh, well, it's because the left-hand limit and the right-hand limits aren't equal. But there's just a jump, so it does not exist. So let's write that, because if you're just learning this, as x approaches from the right, because I kind of like you to have this knowledge already, my function approaches, as I heard somebody say, zero. As x approaches from the left, left g of x, approaches 1. All right, now on all my quizzes, and it's mainly because I let you guys use whatever you want, I always say you got to explain it. Even this one, if you write do, does not exist, count it wrong. I want to know why. And the reason why is because I told you guys the joke. I always told my students, when in doubt, domain, all real numbers, just answer that because you'll probably get it right most of the time. So I want you to know why. Now, 
you're probably thinking, I gotta write all this crap down? For those of you that have probably have had calculus and know about left hand, right hand side limits, you probably like this. If you haven't had calculus, all you have to do is say it does not exist because it, there's a jump there. That's all I want to. That's all I want to know is you recognize that there's a jump in this function. This will come later, okay, in the later sections, but it's something good to know. All right, so let's let you do one. Find the limit of g of x as x approaches 2 equals what? I think it's 1. I think that sounds good to me. So let's see how we get that. This is the value I'm walking towards. Okay, so here I am, do 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 do, and I'm heading towards that value right there. Okay, from either side. I want to know what my function is approaching. I don't want to know what the value of it is. It just so happens in this case that g of 2 equals the limit. That will not always happen. I've got to beat that into your heads, okay? That I want to know as I'm approaching, what is the value of my function approaching? As I approach x, again, if you want to set with a y, what's happening to the y value? Because if, if this was an open circle right there, guess what the answer would be the same? Be no difference. And if you're like, well, that doesn't make sense to me, then your mind is thinking, and it's difficult because you've been beat to death in algebra, your mind is thinking the value of the function. I want to know what it's getting close to, it's approaching, okay? So keep, keep that definitely in mind. All right, see so if I can keep it where you can still see the graph. Number three, find the limit. And um, most of you guys know this because you've used my math lab before. If you're kind of feeling a little weird about this and you're not getting it, in my math lab, you can on the left do study plan and you can work many of these. Even in your homework, you can just say, give me another one, give me another one, give me another one, okay, to get more practice at these. All right, so g of x as x approaches 3 equals what? I hear zero. Somebody want to say one? Does not exist? 47? I think it's 40. There you go. I think it's zero. And I kind of tried to hint to you if I said that was a hole there. Notice there's a hole there. And so some of you say it does not exist because the value of the function there, it does not exist. You're thinking badly. Okay? If I start heading towards this value of three, from the left, from the right, it is approaching it. So in other words, guess what? This is an example of notice g of 3 equals 1. That's that point. Sorry, I got a little low. That's that point up there. But as we approach 3, the function is approaching 0. And again, if your argument is, but there is no value at x equals 3, then you're thinking the value of the function and stop doing it, okay? Think of what it's actually getting close to. Because a lot of times we want to know what it's getting close to. We know it doesn't exist there because the machine keeps shutting down. 3 o'clock every day, the machine shuts down. We want to know why, okay? And so we look at data that's getting really, really close to that time or after that time to see, well, what made it start back up? You know, maybe we didn't start the machine back up, it started back up. All right, now this is, as I showed you in the very beginning, the Blackboard handout limit laws. Okay, and I'll, I'm going to bring it back up here. Now, I don't know, you know, I think a lot of it is because I'm, you know, I kind of have some of your guys' mentality that um, I never liked teachers. Well, I, I have both sides. I have the one side that, my God, she did that in eight steps, and I could have done that in one. I have no problem with that. This isn't you do it my way or it's the highway. There are times I want to see steps. This is not one of them. So, and you'll see that when we get to it. 
However, when you learn things like how to add functions together, how to divide functions together, what did they always tell you to do? Separate them, okay? And get the value of this one, get the value of that one, add them together. That's the same thing here with limits. For most of you, these examples today are going to be, man, why did she go through all those steps? The reason you only, I've only taught you how to find the limit of the identity function and the constant function. I've given you nothing else. You've never had calculus in your life. You can't do anything else, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to end up breaking these down. If I want to find the limit of this function plus this function, what I end up doing is finding the limit of this function then I find the limit of that function and I add them together, okay? Where this becomes important, what if this is a log and this is a sign, you know? I mean, you're gonna get to a point where these are not gonna be baby functions like we start out, you know, linear stuff start, starting out with. And so it's nice, that's all we're doing here is separating them. Let me show you number three, be sure you see that, the constant multiple, okay? Like, th you know, three times some function. Basically, what I'm doing is pulling that constant out front, and then I'm finding the limit of my g of x, and then I just multiply them. Here, my quotient, I can just divide the limits. And then we get down here. We're not going to get to this, certainly not today. But just don't forget, sometimes students forget this whole, if that's a square root, that's the same thing as the one-half power. We like this, okay, when we get to that. All right, so if I... Uh, one thing I wanted to note to you to see is on here, notice it says as x approaches c. Again, if this is the first time I've ever taken this class, I'm confused out of my mind. She's been writing x naught, and now you throw c's up there. They're just values, the values of, that the function's going to. You will normally see in symbols x approaches x naught x approaches c, and x approaches a. Those are normally the ones you see a lot, which just all represent a single point, which may or may not be in the domain of the function. Hence what we said above that a lot of times the a lot of times the limit will not equal the value of the function because the value of the function doesn't exist at that point. Okay? So that's that's all that says. But I know I know students sometimes will be like, why is she using I tend to use X naught again, that's the way I learned it, but you'll see most of the formulas will use C for any value. Okay, so let's do some examples. If I have the limit of 2x plus 5 as x approaches negative 7. Now, most everybody in here can say, well, you say in your head, when you're working a limit problem, the very first thing you say is, can I just take that number and plug it in there? Bam, I'm done. Well, we never give you problems that easy, right? But if you've never had calculus before, you don't know how to do that. I have not showed you how to find the limit of a line of 2x. I showed you the identity. I have not showed you that. So bear with me. Let's write this out in steps so when they get more difficult, you can do it. So all our laws said, well, I can take and separate that 2x as x approaches negative 7, and I can separate the 5 as x approaches negative 7. So I'm just pulling these apart. I have not taught you how to find the limit of the function 2x. However, that constant multiple rule says pull that 2 out front. The limit of x is left over as x approaches negative 7. Plus, what's the limit of 5 as x approaches negative 7? 5. So let's just go ahead and throw that in there. That's that piece. Okay, I mean, you can write it again if you wanted. Now, I have taught you how to find the limit of the identity function of negative, as x approaches negative 7, which is negative 7. So I plug in negative 7, don't forget my plus 5, and you should get negative 9. All right, now for 
those of you that say, well, why didn't you just plug that in? I mean, and that's the point I really want to make is that's what you're going to do most of the time. If this question was on your quiz this Friday, I don't care if you go straight to there. I, I don't need to see all of this. I want you to know how to do this when you need to do it. Don't do it if you don't need to do it. And that's why I just wanted to go through the steps. Well, let's say if I had, for example, the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 3 over x plus 6. Well, again, for what we're doing right now is we say, well, I haven't taught you how to find the limit of a rational function. I mean, that's what that is. That's a rational function. But if I plug in 2, then I get 5 over 8 and I'm done. But the rule says that this equals the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 3 over the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus 6. In other words, I've separated those. I'm going to find the limit of the top. I'm going to find the limit of the bottom. Okay. Again, we would write the limit as x approaches 2 of x plus the limit as x approaches 2 of 3 all over the limit of x as x approaches 2 plus the limit of 6 as x approaches 2. So we just broke this into lots of pieces because eventually we're going to have to. And, you know, I always tell students, if you learn how to do the easy stuff in pieces, then when it gets harder, you just do the same thing. Well, of course, the limit, my identity, as x approaches 2, we just said is that same value. We said our constant, just 3. This is 2. That's 6. Sorry. And then we get our answer. So this helps you go from these steps so you understand when you see the, these in a larger problem. Okay, just, I mean, it's, I've, I've always said, and I don't know, maybe it's because I, my um, background was computer programming, that computer programmers normally do very well in math. And the reason why they know how to break things down into functions, you know, procedures, and that's all we're doing. We're making a big problem look easier. All right, so this is actually, both of these are theorems. Which says, basically, I don't want to go through all those steps. So to evaluate the limit of a polynomial function. So it doesn't have to be the example I give you was a linear function, just some polynomial function. As x approaches some value, c then substitute C, I got too many T's in there, C for X. <laughs> so in other words, the limit of my polynomial as X approaches C equals the value of the function at C. So in other words, the limit and the value of the functions are equal in this case. Will not always happen, but they are equal in this case. Then my other theorem, well, it ain't mine, but whose ever it is, to evaluate the limit of a rational function. at x is approaching c when the denominator cannot equal zero substitute c. So in other words, if I have this polynomial I mean, this is, you probably wonder, you know, why do you have to take all these classes? Well, in algebra, that's when you learn what a rational function is, so we just assume you know what it is. It's a polynomial divided by a polynomial. So if both of these, make that look a little better, p of x and q of x are polynomials, and 
if I plug in C into my Q function, so Q of C does not equal zero, then my limit as X approaches C of P of X over Q of X is equal to P of C over Q of C. Let you rest your hand and try to get caught up there. So all these two theorems are saying, and again, I like to write them out as theorems. Again, you're going to write a lot in this class because this is going to become your book. But second, I want you to be able to understand how to read this. Basically, both of these theorems here are just simply saying, I don't need these limit laws if I have polynomials or rational functions and I'm not going to end up dividing by zero, I'm just going to plug the value in. Again, that, mean, that means the limit of a polynomial and the good rational functions <coughs> are equal to the value of the function. Okay, that's all that means. Well, then my question would be then what if we don't have something so nice? What if the denominator becomes zero? Then what do we do? Well, we'll, go, we'll do another example. We kind of did that at the very beginning. Is let's say, for example, I want to know what the limit of x minus 5 over x squared minus 25 as x approaches 5 is. The first thing I do is I say, can I just plug that value in? Nope, can't do it. So then my second choice is, that's like the first one, this is the difference of two squares, so that's something I can factor. So let's go ahead and factor that, the limit as x goes to five, x plus five times x minus five. That cancels, meaning I have a one left back up there. So I'm finding the limit as x is approaching 5 of 1 over x plus 5. Guess what? Now I can just actually plug that in. And so I get 1 over 5 plus 5 or 1 tenth. All right, going back to what is a limit? What are, what are we doing? She keeps writing all this crap down and I don't even know what we're doing. You've got to graph this stuff. If you sit here and keep working problems like this, one, you'll never be able to visualize what's going on. And I'm just going to be a little messy here and just do a, a fast hand graph. So if I have something, it's going to look um, like this. And here is my negative 5, because as you can see now, I can't plug in a negative 5. And of course, there's going to be a hole there at 5. But what I'm trying to get you to see, this value right here that I'm approaching, okay, the value of the function that I'm approaching is that number. If you graph this and you zoomed way, way in right there, you would see that you would be at a tenth. Okay, and so certainly graph these to at least know, well, yeah, it kind of makes sense, the answer that I got, because that is what the function is approaching as x equals five. Now really go back in your algebra arsenal. I want to find the limit of the square root of x squared plus 100 minus 10 over x squared as x approaches 0. You guys kind of caught up on the writing? Yell at me if I need to slow down, lady. I know I can get right. I think the worst part is, as I just taught this is at 8 o'clock, so I tend to go faster because <laughs> I just said this, you know, an hour ago. All right, so as we're catching up there, again, you see a limit problem. Very first thing you do, plug in zero. Can't do it. Second thing you do, look to see if there's something you can factor. Is there something you can factor? You want to separate square root of x squared plus square root of 100? That's a big no no. <laughs> I don't if you can see something you can factor, you're a you know a smarter person than I am. I don't see anything you can factor that. But do you remember something in algebra? Did somebody say? Yeah, Conjugate. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. In other words, they're saying, in a way, multiply this by one. Because what we want to do is we want to get rid of a root. Most most
most students think of conjugates, well, that was the when we had a, you know, a radical in the denominator. It's just you have a radical, okay? Um, in fact, you can have conjugates without radicals. But let's see what happens. Let's see, in other words, what we're doing. So the limit as x approaches 0, I'm just rewriting this again, plus 100 minus 10 over x squared. My conjugate, x squared plus uh, 100, is plus 10. Okay, so your sign's different. i got to make this 1. In other words, x squared plus 100 plus 10. So if this is kind of new or you're like, yeah, I kind of remember that word, and you want to look it up, we're finding the conjugate is what we're doing. Okay, we're multiplying it by the conjugate. If I multiply this out, and a lot of times, you know, students will doubt what I've done, but what I'm doing, I'm foiling the top. I mean, that's what I'm doing. You get where you recognize how to do this quickly. I'm multiplying this times this. Well, if you multiply a square root times a square root, you basically just get rid of the square root. So I have x squared plus 100, no longer under a root. This is the part that some of you may need to do this step. I'm going to multiply this times this and that times that. Notice they're opposites. The middle term cancels out. Okay. And so now I just have negative 10 times 10, so I end up getting minus 100. And on the bottom, I'm not going to, and this is something you need to get used to, don't multiply the, the bottom out yet. See if you need to. So I'm just going to say this is x squared times square root of x squared plus 100 plus 10. That's all I did. Well, your eyeball hopefully is going right there. And then it says, and you know, it might be easier to see with that gone, it says, oh, well these are being, this, is, this x squared is by itself, this is outside by itself, that cancels, I'm happy now. Because what it gives me now is I'm finding the limit as x approaches zero of one over square root of x squared plus 100 plus 10, and why am I happy? Can I plug in zero now? Sure. That's what you're doing. And sometimes it takes a lot more steps than this, but I want to get to the point where now I can just simply plug in my zero. So zero squared plus 100 plus 10, and then of course I get the square root of 100 plus 10, which is 10 plus 10, which is 1 20th, or 0 0.05, and I leave it there with you to what did she say to do with these things graph it what am I going to graph that sucker right there you're going to graph this function after you graph it see as you're approaching zero if you do not see I mean the, the decimals are probably easier to see on the calculator see that your function is approaching this value and that is exactly where I ended in my first class. So that's six minutes faster, wasn't too much faster. Um, we will finish 2-2 two, two next class and maybe even start 2-3. If you are not in my math lab, the time is now. Get in my math lab. Uh-huh.